Hi everyone, it's uh, MJ and I'm here with uh, Yuri, who many of you might remember from the channel, which we did, uh, yeah, when, when did we do that last interview? December? It was December slash January. December slash January. Yeah. And the reason why we did it is because Yuri, unfortunately, decided to abandon... Fortunately. Yeah, you know, abandon <laughs> actuarial science. And instead you are now pursuing, well, I'm seeing here, Department of just Mathematics and Applied Mathematics. Is yeah. that... Is that like the new... So yeah, the Department of Maths at UCT is called the Department of Maths and Applied Maths okay. because the two are technically separate, but one department. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. And I mean, first off, how does it feel leaving actuarial science? Like, is uh, there FOMO? No, or? to be honest, I think it was the best decision ever. The best decision? I was, <laughs> I, although my year was very intense mm -hmm. and probably my most intense year since I've been at varsity. Okay. It was definitely much more enjoyable. I had so okay. much more fun doing it, yeah. All right. Because, yeah, I mean, this, this is the thing is some, some people find that actuarial science isn't for them and they either move to accounting, data science, uh, pure statistics. Um, so, yeah, it's nice to see uh, another thing that we can jump into if we of find course. actuarial science isn't for us. Yeah, well, but, I kind of want to go into mathematical finance. I just took a route around which, which carrying is basically, one with AXI. It's basically AXI. Yeah, but there's I mean, none of this ARM Profcom stuff, eh? Fair enough, fair yeah, enough. I still did Finicos this year. Okay. So that so, was great. Yeah, it was the best AXI course I've done at university. Well, this is the thing. is actuarial science has got a bit of like a, an umbrella. It's a whole bunch of various topics. Yes. And I mean, the one thing that I really like is, I mean, mean variance hedging that is subject CM2, or what we did as CT8, okay. or in South Africa we refer to it as A214. There's, there's a lot of different yeah, codes for the exact same... I don't even know the codes at all, so I'm just like, which one is that? Basically financial engineering. Okay, so, so yeah, financial maths. And then Economics. what I like is, I mean, and this is why I've included the ActureTech logo, is, you know, this is something that... Brand I'm, royalty. Yeah, working with is we're looking at technology with actuarial science. Okay. And I mean, neural networks are, I don't know, I really don't actually understand them. And that's what, what I'm hoping to chat to you a little Let's bit about. Let's see if anyone understands them. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe I understand them. Well, maybe, maybe give us, before we, before we get into your whole topic, because it's mean variance hedging with recurrent neural networks in incomplete markets. I mean, that's not Buzzwords, that's, eh? that's, that's like a sentence. That's not like a heading. That's like a sentence. Originally, it was actually longer. Was it longer? Because this top, the heading now is basically, so there's three chapters in this project okay. and it's the last chapter is on this. Oh, okay. Yes. So originally it was, uh, I think, the mathematics of arbitrage and mean variance hedging with recurrent neural networks in incomplete markets. Oh, That's way too much of a mouthful and I think this captures the essence of where I wanted to get to, you know, the, mm -hmm. the big things are that. Okay. Everything else is just building up the mathematical intuition behind trading and everything else. Okay, so I mean, before we get into trading and hedging and incomplete markets, maybe can you just give us a quick word on what, it, what exactly is a neural network? Okay, so... Like in, in simple language, simple language. <laughs> simple, simple language. So it's basically a system of functions okay. uh, that are universal approximations. So if you have some sort of function you want to approximate, neural networks, there's a proof in my thing as well about they can basically um, approximate any continuous function. There's, there's a lot more functions they can do, approximate, but... Mm -hmm. For my case specific, I did the continuous function version, yeah. Okay, so, so correct me if I'm wrong, but neural network tries to find the function that links input to output. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. with a lot of those, looks like spider webs, eh? With a lot of like, <laughs> like if you nodes see those and lattices pictures in between. Always, yeah. Okay, okay. And now coming to, I mean, mean variance. What is, what is your opinion on, on mean variance? Do you see it as this is the framework that defines finance or do you see it simply as a model on which to explore the so neural networks? For this case specific, I just needed some sort of model. Mm -hmm. um, so the code is actually written in a more general way so that we can add different cost functions at the end. Okay. So a lot of papers have been written on mean variance aging, which has a lot of criticized 
criticisms because mm-hmm. um, it weights losses and gains equally. But yes, that's not really good if you're trying to make some like you don't want to necessarily make profit. You want to try and get as close as possible to the payoff. But obviously, as a company, you're risk averse. You don't want to take these losses. So there's a lot of criticisms on it, but it was a great framework to at least begin the research. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, just, just for those who, who don't know, mean variance is a, a framework for portfolio theory that suggests the two things that investors are most interested in is the return given by mean and risk given by variance. Of course, the mean here is, is in an absolute term. You know, they would say 10% is you know, better than, say, 5%. Whereas, whereas in finance, some people actually prefer getting you know, return in a relative uh, sense. Yeah as in, you know, plus three over a benchmark, and that benchmark being inflation or uh, something else. Because there's no point getting 12% return, and then inflation is 15%, yeah. and you've got a negative three uh, real. So the one criticism is that the mean here is too simplistic, and the other part here is the variance is, as you were referring to it, it's not that we dislike uh, variance, or that we dislike risk, we dislike downside risk. Yeah. So if something's got a probability of going below, we're unhappy with it. But if there's a probability of it going above, we super stoked. We super stoked. Yeah. And this, but this framework doesn't doesn't capture that. Yeah. And then the other one weakness of the mean variance um, theorem is that it requires covariances, which are normally quite difficult to obtain in yeah. using empirical uh, data. But with that uh, said and done. Um, very quickly on, on hedging, I'll give like a very brief thing and then Enjoy it. chop in if, if you think that there's, there's more to be said. Essentially I'm with hedging... I'm scared of actually giving the uh, <laughs> talk here. <yeah. laughs> Dora, you, you're going to come in and explain what this thing is. Um, but no, yeah, so, so, so hedging, I think a nice example is, let's say you, you sell a, a call option, which means you collect a premium and you give somebody the right but not the obligation to purchase a stock at a certain price. Yeah. Hedging is when you try and cover that position. Yes. And there is something called the covered position where you physically buy the stock, but if the price goes down, then you, you, have... don't, you don't hit that zero mark. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's also something known as the naked strategy, which is where you don't do anything and you just assume that additional risk and try and profit from it. Um, and then there's the stop loss where you try and buy and sell according to strike price. And then you can also do something like delta hedging and all of that. So I want to ask just very quickly, what, what type of hedging, are we talking about delta hedging here? Um, As in like hedging referring just to the price, how the price changes. Yeah, so it's more, but remember, so neural networks are quite black box, mm-hmm. but we did compare it to uh, delta hedge black shorts. Okay. So that's at least the comparison, but the neural network itself is a little bit black box. Oh, so it will, it will determine yeah. what it, it should hedge and what it shouldn't yeah, hedge. It, should, it buys and sells, and you can get a stock uh, okay. price movement and see how it's actually performing and stuff. Unfortunately, I didn't put it in this actual thesis, but maybe we'll add some pictures or something afterwards. Okay. No, yeah, we can do some little editing. Yeah, yeah. so I'll send you some photos okay. to put in. And then finally, because <laughs> you can see it's a, it's a big heading, um, incomplete markets. Does this mean that you're not assuming that the market is efficient or, or strong form uh, efficient? So it's, none, it's, not, it's not really not, those. Um, so we'll characterize uh, something. So there's two fundamental theorems of asset pricing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one says that under no arbitrage, an equivalent martingale measure exists. Okay. And then uh, in incomplete markets, well, let's just start with a complete market is such that every bounded claim is attainable. So you okay. can trade to get your payoff perfectly replicating it. But obviously that's not very realistic. In mm-hmm. real life, you have no idea what the hell's going on. And so that's incomplete markets. Not every bu- not every claim is attainable. Okay. So how do we minimize our risks? Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, then let's, let's jump into straight this big thing over here. Um, <laughs> first of all, yeah, can you explain what this formula is in words? So they call this a discrete uh, stochastic integral. <laughs> But okay. let's go with simplistic words. So the thing on the side, obviously, that's just notation. And the thing on the right, basically, uh, phi over there. This little guy. Ooh, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, that phi represents uh, your position held in the stock. Mm -hmm. So let's say you hold two units and then the XK and the XK minus one is the stock movement. So at X, uh, the price okay. at XK minus one and XK. So you hold a stock and if it goes up, then you're making that gain. So this stochastic integral represents your gains from trading. Okay. Yeah. The, basically the area and the little curve. Something like that. Something yeah. like that. Except now it's discrete time, so it jumps. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and I see, yeah, you've done it now on September the 15th. So you've just handed this thing in. Yeah, it was, it was due last week, Monday. So um, I mean, could what a push. How, how many hours did you put into this? Um, in the beginning, it was actually relatively easy to like formalize the maths behind trading and stuff. When I started the code, mm -hmm. that was a nightmare. I'd spend my holiday uh, coding until like two in the morning every single day. What, what coding thing did you use? Like maths lab or? Uh, or? So most of, let's say the plots and stuff is all yeah. front end in Python. Okay. And then I had uh, Malusi Mabuso help me do the C++. Um, oh, you did the C++? End. Yeah. So, we tried Python, everything. Uh, okay. it turns out TensorFlow sucks. Okay. It's very slow. Don't wanna let's not hate too much. <laughs> Don't wanna be tracked down. But yeah, it was it was a little bit too slow, but it we try to use it for things like inbuilt gradients and stuff like that. But we ended up just coding the gradient descent ourselves instead. Okay. Because it sped it up. Well, I mean, this is the thing. I had a friend who did a, a thesis also from UCT on predicting soccer, um, you know, match okay. results. Mm -hmm. And that, that thing needed like 18 hours to, to calculate the parameters every time yeah, you ran so this, so this one is a, a dummy version of what I actually want to do. Okay. didn't get, because my computer sucked, but I just got a new computer. I actually okay. have it here, but we won't show it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I just got my new laptop and I'm hoping to rerun my code at the more high level and see why don't you use a, a cloud uh, yeah well probably as well but i want to add all the bonuses faster laptop cloud cloud just okay. let's just thing. yeah it's nice to test at least when i'm doing my tests to mm -hmm. make sure the code's running fine i'm not going to use a cloud to test my code Fair so at least that speeds up my like, testing procedures make sure everything's going right but yeah a lot are, we ran into a lot of errors my mistakes big mistakes uh yeah, so like I ran my code for like two days waiting for my results and they came back just nans. Errors, mm. errors, errors, errors. And that was that was your, your bad programming? It was me. Um, so That's good, you take responsibility. I did take responsibility, but it's also like when you think of the exponential distribution, right? Mm -hmm. What is a more natural parameter, scale or rate? I guess it's as good as mine. Okay, so thinking about like arrival times, a rate would be great, right? Like, yeah. So that's more natural, right? So the mistake that I made, so I used the inbuilt NumPy uh, exponential distribution thing, and they take in a scale parameter. Uh, and that, and it's so it was, it's the opposite one way around, it's one over, yeah. Yes. So the okay. jumps occur too much. <laughs> and I mean, that it just felt natural to me, but maybe I should have maybe read the documentation a little bit better. So, but so we, we, we call this model error. We call this modeling error. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was bad. Just apply. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's, let's jump into, I think, yeah, we don't need to go through yeah, the little plagiarism skip. thingy. Um, talk to me about this. Is this important for the discussion? Because I know you said there's some boring maths in the beginning that we can yeah, do. It's not boring. <laughs> but I'm just saying for maybe your community, they might not enjoy too much maths. Um, I mean, yeah, so it's it's important. It's just a it's just an overview. But I, I think we've spoken about it already. Like I formalized some the idea of stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have the expected square replication. We're trying to minimize okay. to the mean variance, and then just the the two neural networks running concurrently. Is this is, is this nice. the neural network? Yes. Yeah, so, so a lot of times I see people use um, about n plus one. Neural mm -hmm. networks for each trade, like yeah. each strategy has its own neural network. Uh, so what we did is, we have this C parameter here, that's, con at like it's the memory cell. It holds some memory. So, um, I believe like some Markov Markovian processes just need a small dimension of a memory cell. Okay. And something with that you need more um, memory for, you can increase the size of the memory cell. So something like that could 
to, you know, like boot models, mean reversion, uh, momentum, stuff like that. So something like a memory cell could supersede that okay. idea, yeah. And then the other neural network is just to predict the trading strategy, what position you should hold in the stock. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, coming, coming to that, what you were talking about there, the market, because the market of property is that the only information I need in order to predict the future is the present. Yes. The fact that the entire past or the entire history is contained in the present. Pretty much. Now, is this memory cell saying that's not necessarily the case? So, no, no. So, if something's Markovian, yeah. you don't need a big dimension, a memory cell, so you don't need to hold a lot of information. Okay. So, then it just takes relevant information of like the now or like, you know, mm -hmm. as small increments as possible. But if you have some sort of process that has, you need a lot of information from the past data, then you can increase the size of this memory cell okay. and hold more information. You know. and, and is there, I mean, I'm just trying to think, what, what examples of other information would you maybe hold? Like the price the day before or? So it, it depends how overboard you want to go. Okay. Uh, some stock, maybe let's say you're trying to hedge something on wheat farms or something. Maybe it can keep into account the weather Oh, okay. Yeah, some is, not always, but I mean that's quite an interesting thing to think about, yeah. Okay. That that opens up quite a lot of modeling possibilities. Yeah. So okay. nice thing about neural networks, they're actually pretty flexible. They're pretty flexible. Okay, not too bad. Um anything else you want to talk about over here? Um well we'll get to it, but so what what allows you to actually like does a parameter thing exist such that it actually minimizes this function? Mm -hmm. So the first one is uh, the projection theorem. So there is actually a trading strategy such that it minimizes this error. And then from the universal approximation theorem, you can furthermore approximate that strategy with the neural network. Okay. Yeah. That sounded confusing. Let's go. <laughs> I must say, this is, I'm definitely <laughs> over, my, over my head here. Um, oh, that's that's why I'm, I'm glad I'm talking with you through it, not, not me just trying to go through it myself. Be like, hey everyone, this is Yuri's project. Um, well, let's, yeah, let's discuss it. So, I mean, yeah, this is, this is your content. I mean, stochastic processes. Yeah, well, so I'm hoping everyone knows that. So we can, yeah. We can skip chapter zero. Yeah, so we can skip. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's basically a random variable that changes throughout time. Yes. Uh, Martingale, that is... The current value is the best estimator for the future. Yeah, intuitively, yes. Intuitively, Basically, cool. Yeah. But in finance, don't we, we use like sub martingales because we allow for the force of interest in that? Yes, because it has the upward. Yes, but that's, that's yeah. like. So, like but remember that when you price something, you need a martingale because it can actually be shown that. If you're not using a martingale measure, there's an arbitrage. There's an arbitrage, yeah. yes. And with the fundamental theorems, as I said, like no arbitrage means there exists a equivalent Martingale measure, and you use the Martingale measure to price. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's important. It it is important. It you is do important. You need to know what the Martingale is. Okay. Yes. Um. And then so that's chapter zero. So we can we've basically done chapter zero. Yeah. Chapter zero. Done. Chapter one: theory of derivative pricing in discrete time. Um. Is this something that you want to spend maybe some time on, like when we get there? Or? Yeah, I, I think we we can spend some time. We can skip over binomial model. Um, anyone familiar with the stuff mm -hmm. and we don't really use binomial model to do anything further it was just a, a nice example of something that's complete that has no arbitrage and yeah. a, it's, you know binomial models often just used just to it's get super you simplistic into it. yeah. yes it's very simplistic the whole idea is that a shake can either go up or it can go down yes and, and you then... kind of assume a jump yes. like a certain rate going up and down then yeah and then that almost forms the building block of the black skulls model. Yeah. They kind of take that into... Yeah, yeah, they do take it into account slightly. Obviously, with the continuous time, yes. it can jump anywhere. <laughs> and you know how the sample parts are, they're crazy. So. Yes. Those, uh, those are what? Those are like ITO processes and yeah. those, those crazy things. Okay. <laughs> it's um, not if you needed help. <laughs> I still haven't pulled through for the help. <laughs> And then, um, what does LSTM stand for? I can't really remember, but I think long, <laughs> long short-term memory. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. And then that's the recurrent neural networks. networks. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Formulation. Okay, and we'll we'll yeah, let's jump into and talk about this type of stuff. 
Um, so oh, yeah, you can actually click on the thing and just skip oh, straight to okay, so I think maybe you in case, in case a... there's a pretty picture, then people can. Can people access this paper online, or is this like it's it's on my LinkedIn? Oh, is it on LinkedIn? Like they can go find it on my LinkedIn. Okay, so there's, there's I don't think there's a good quality version, so I guess maybe I'll find some way to put it on. Yeah, put, put it on yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah. No, look, I mean that's the thing. The views are very small. They yeah. they will. They'll be like, hey, this is quite cool. Or, I've been doing something similar, or you can improve it here, or you can. Yeah, that, that'll model. be very nice. Like, I would like some feedback on how to improve as yeah. well, and maybe how to do some extensions. Because I'm planning to do my masters in mm -hmm. mathematical finance next year, and I would actually like to extend this sort of thing. Yeah. And that's what I like to say is I've got the smartest audience on YouTube. Yeah. Think about it. Yeah. I mean, no one's smarter than that trees. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we've got the, the smartest audience watching here. Um, okay, yeah, so like this this is the preamble. It's interesting, yeah. Ooh, that, that stuff looks scary. Look at that. Is that that filtration thing? Yeah, so this is a filtration, right? Ooh, yeah, let's just skip it. Should that. show my tattoos, eh? Hey. <laughs> oh, you've got a tattoo of the filtration thing. Yeah. Yeah, we can, we can yeah. do one. We can do one glimpse into it. Hey, show some Let's skin see. on the channel. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Very cool. And a brownie motion. And you got brownie. Mo <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he actually the guy who did that. What was his name? Vine, Vine or Wiener? Wiener. Wiener. Yeah, you know, Wiener. Wiener. He, Wiener. <laughs> he wrote a book called Cybernetics, oh. which I'm trying to get my hands on. So yeah. That could be cool. And all about you know, the future and artificial intelligence and... Well, they're taking over. Yeah, he was a smart boy. Smart boy, that guy. Okay, this is still the preamble, preamble. Yeah, it's long. Oh, gosh. So, so okay. there you go. Theory of derivative practicing in discrete time. Okay. Looking nasty. Talk to me about this. So, obviously, we need some sort of mathematical description mm -hmm. of these things. So... Obviously, something gaining information or changing over time, a stochastic process, best, best way to go, right? Mm -hmm. So, we have some sort of stock dynamics uh, that follow a stochastic process and the tuple with um, the filter probability space and the stock price mm -hmm. is called a market. Okay. Right? Uh, but... We're just trying to price things, so we simplified a little bit further and introduced discounted prices. Uh, yes, because it makes the maths clean, but they're equivalent. Okay. But it makes the maths clean, which is very nice. Okay. Um, and I mean, is that, give me a quick, or explain quickly, why are we doing discrete time and not continuous time? Just for simplicity or? Um, so also just for more realistic approaches in terms of trading and everything, right? Uh, you don't trade every day or every split second, mm -hmm. I guess, and you don't have a computer that's doing it for you in continuous time. Unless, yet. unless, unless you're trading crypto, because the crypto market never sleeps. But does something trade for you continuously? You can get those little bots, but they, I guess yeah, they're not continuous. They yeah. they just discrete at a very yeah fine, fine point. Um, okay, keep keep talking, Eric. Keep okay, talking. so here we have a idea of a trading strategy, right? As we spoke about earlier, it's just. The amount you hold at a certain time up mm -hmm. until the next time those are predictable so it just means that at time t minus one you know the trade to make for the period t minus one to t okay um yeah so obviously you have to make the trade and then either gain or don't oh, gain okay. and what you're trying to do is obviously hedge a specific payoff that only happens at the end in and, our case. And tell me, with, with this trading, are you also taking in consideration fees, trading fees? Um, no, but we were, we want to extend it a little bit. We're going to, okay. some maybe fees, certain things like that. We did take into account maybe like public holidays, but that's just, you know, you take off the amount of trading days. So that was an easy, easy fix. Yeah. Easy one to account for. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, we, we want to extend it, maybe take into account fees, but it's not very optimal to compare something like that to the Black Shoals model. Oh, yeah, because it also doesn't rate. take it. Yeah, with fees. Yeah. If you count any fees or any jumps, Black Shoals just can't keep up, which is a problem for yeah. uh, this big formula that everyone seems to be using. Well, that's the thing <laughs> is, I mean, yeah, despite all these criticisms, it's still, it's still like the main it's, thing used. It's popular, yeah. yeah. I've heard there were, there were a lot of mistakes in the first paper that was written about it, but... You know how life works. If you're the first one to get something out, 
Well, the, the best example is the fact that uh, Merton and Scholes uh, joined that hedge fund long-term capital management yep. and stuffed up big time. Big time. I mean, they were they, going well and then they, was that one in a million have occurrences, hey. just lost everything. <laughs> there was, Always. yeah, the Thai currency got devalued, the Russian bonds defaulted, and they basically got wiped out. Yeah. Because um, they kind of thought, oh, the market's not, uh, they're like diversification, you know? Yeah. And then they didn't realize panic spreads throughout the whole market and destroyed them. Yeah. Um, and that's why there's potential. Yours could maybe take them on oh, in the future. We'll see, yeah. Hey? <laughs> Let's see, hopefully. Hopefully I can do something big. And people of the future will be learning, you know. The, the Robertson model. Yeah, Robertson slash Jordan model. Because, you know, I would have I would have added in my... <laughs> don't think, don't think so. Yeah. My, my two cents. <laughs> maybe we can work on something else. <laughs> okay, so talk to me. What's what's happening here? Uh, this is just for assumptions coming up. Uh, we mm-hmm. need some sort of, sort of bound on the trading strategy. Also, just... Logically, you can't borrow infinite amounts, right? A lot of people just assume you can. Mm-hmm. So it's just uh, also just makes the maths clean. Also, it's just intuitive. Can't okay. bound or like can't borrow infinite amounts of money, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is just bounding the trading strategy. All right. Um, yeah, and that final bound is just like right on the bottom of the paper. That's just my assumption to make my proofs easier. <laughs> Explain what you mean by that. Is this just kind of... So the, the usual one that they use is the finite credit line where you just can't borrow an infinite amount of money. Yeah. Uh, for mine, to make my proofs work, I bounded the whole trading strategy. <laughs> by what? So what is... So there's just, there's just a bound on the trading strategy. There's a finite amount that you can either borrow or... Is that just to make the computational easier? Like... So the model runs quicker? Or uh, so in the actual neural network and stuff, that's not necessarily. It's just for the proofs of existence Proof and stuff of like this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, arbitrage, arbitrage is basically the idea of making a risk-free profit. Yes. Or, or having the probability of making profit in a risk-free yeah, market. Yeah, so it's, you start with nothing. Yes. Uh, there's a chance of making a gain. And then the probability of making a positive gain, so... Is, a, is greater than zero. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you are saying here in the section we sell financing. Um, talk to me about the stuff. What's happening here? Well, this is just a nice baby example just to get everyone into this idea of arbitrage, right? Okay, so you're just giving a... Yeah. A just little a example. Two, a two-stock example there. Warming. Okay, so can we skip that? Yeah, we can skip that. Uh, we can probably skip a lot of this. Let's not talk about too much maths. Let's go to the definition of a super replica <laughs> that's pretty cool let's go okay the, uh, the probability measure probability measure so we need this idea of an equivalent martingale measure so okay something that makes the stocks dynamic a martingale because as we said earlier if you can't find such a uh, measure you can actually find an arbitrage mm-hmm. so you can make risk-free profit yeah, so that leads us, if you like, scroll maybe like two more pages. Two more, oh geez, there's all of <laughs> this. This maths, maths. Oh yeah, check the little lemmas. Yeah, so here it comes. Fundamental theorem of asset pricing one. So, under no arbitrage opportunities, okay. there exists an equivalent martingale measure. So, yeah. Okay, and then you give this whole proof. Yeah. Did you come up with this proof yourself? No. <laughs> oh. I read a bunch of papers. Okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot. It's very interesting. It's okay. great. I mean, yeah, that just looks... Yeah, it's a bit messy. Yeah. Like, I wish I could come up with something like that all <laughs> by myself. Maybe in the future. Like, I am getting into it. I did come up with some proofs myself in this paper. Yeah. Like I said, you combined just it with the Jordan model really and I, I can be your, your proof guy. Okay, yeah. definitely. Well, yeah. I can make coffee while you try to figure out the proofs. Yeah, but don't you it's know, that's the... Uh, they call that, like, the math... They say mathematicians are machines. Oh, yeah. We're taking coffee and we output proofs. There we go. Yeah. So I can be the, your field stop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, got, I got good coffee. Um, okay. Pricing and replication. Um, anything here that's worth chatting about? So it's just a, so a replicating strategy. Okay. Right? So it's something that replicates a fail, right? So. Mm-hmm. That's essentially what we're <laughs> trying to do, hey. Yeah, so that's it's just getting that whole notion of what we 
you know, we're building up to this uh, hedging, trying to minimize your risk, you know, hedge, mm -hmm. like perfect replication. And this is also introducing that notion of a complete market, which is coming just now. So in that, the complete market is one where every bounded claim is attainable. So that means that a replicating strategy exists mm -hmm. for each bounded claim, obviously not in real life. So in complete markets. In complete markets. Okay. Yeah. Um, you got some definitions. So you got another example. Yeah, we got we got to keep it going. Examples are nice. They take up so lots this of space. one. This one is uh, introducing the notion of what happens uh, if you do have an incomplete market. So, turns out when you have incomplete markets, your set of equivalent martingale measures is infinite dimension. So okay. there's infinitely many equivalent martingale measures, and then your no arbitrage price is actually an interval. Okay. and not one value, which a lot of courses and notes and textbooks assume that, you know, the law of one price. So but there's no such thing as the law of one price. But, okay, and so how does that then influence your, your paper? So we're going to be working in an incomplete market where there's some sort of band of prices. Okay. Uh, I won't be talking about the bands, but, <laughs> but yeah, so there's, there's no unique price. So there's no uh, replicating strategy, but how, how do you hedge in that sense or how do you price something in that sense when there's this interval that you can actually get no arbitrage prices? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously... So it's going to add to the complexity. Yeah. So with, the, with this interval, right, if, you, if you're the seller, you want to sell as high as possible. But if you're the buyer, you want to buy as low as possible. Well, where's the middle ground? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So something like that. Okay. Okay. And then, is this still the example here? Still example, still example. Oh, here we go. This is what you're talking about. A market is complete if every bounded contingent claim is attainable. Yeah. Cool. Does that mean we can skip this? Oh, so here's fundamental theorem of asset pricing. Two. Oh, here's number two. Yeah. So okay. this comes with the, another characterization of uh, more equivalent things. So if every bounded claim is attainable, then it turns out that the equivalent, the set of equivalent martingale measures uh, has cardinality one. So there's only just one equivalent martingale measure and that uh, results in like a unique price and certain things like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then so, cause yeah, that's the big difference if we had to go up to the other one, where was that one? There. Yeah, so non-empty, uh, so that can either have one or infinitely many. Okay. And then that's just the added bonus. So it's under no arbitrage, the market's complete if that happens, yeah. Did I? Oh no, I jumped it. Yeah, you jumped it, but it's fine. There we go. Okay, cool. Oh, let's go. Let's see how it goes. Talk to me about this. Oh, this is matrix. actually my proof. <laughs> is this your proof? I made it up. You yeah, made okay. this one up. So to be honest, I, I read papers and I, like, I couldn't understand anything. So I was like, okay, I'm going to make up a proof for this. You made up a proof? Okay. Yeah, so I was scared it was going to be wrong. <laughs> My Is supervisor said it was fine. It just needed more, uh, so it's a more explanation. more explanation. And then that came into the second matrix and stuff, just explaining why this matrix is invertible. And I just made claims like, boom, this matrix is invertible. Done. You know, you know, this is like I'm dying now. You know, there's probably a viewer out there right now who's probably like doing the maths in his head and he's like, Oh, maybe ooh, it is wrong. I'm very scared. Maybe, but please, if it is, like, hit me up. Okay. I, I want to put a little something. comment below. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll come back and read them. Cool. <laughs> okay, yeah. so you actually did this. That's impressive. Yeah, so I just took a, a arbitrary claim with okay. the H's, right? And you have this trading strategies on the right and this matrix just represents the linear combinations of these things and obviously if a unique solution exists the matrix is invertible okay and the second explanation was just why it's square and why it's invertible because under no arbitrage and the existence of a unique martingale measure this second equation basically says okay that matrix must be invertible for that solution to be unique yeah Okay, okay. Um, let's keep going, going down here. We got the binomial. Yeah, everyone's model. wet dream. 
Should we skip it? Because I do. I am looking at the time. We've got. Yeah, we've we got, we got the Formula it. One soon. Yeah, let's go. We've, let's go watch Formula One. We've got the Formula One soon. I say what? Should we do this as a part one and a part two video? We could. Or we or can do, finish. Or, or do you want oh, to yeah, finish? Actually, we might not be able to finish because, like, like, let's 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 finish. Let's finish. Let's finish it. Yeah. Okay. We should okay. be fine. Yeah. We're gonna do this. Okay. Um, skip by no model. Let's go. Skip by Okay. We, let's get to the meat. Let's get to. This is the big stuff. This is the big stuff. Yeah. This is the big stuff. Uh, yeah, but we can. We've already spoken about a lot of this introductory stuff, just minimizing this stuff. Okay. Um, Tell me what you stuff. A lot of simplifications. Let's go down. So, can carry on. <laughs> it's a lot of the, the meat. Oh, so, so, here's one thing uh, that I was talking about earlier, just whether a trading strategy actually exists that minimizes this. So we use this theorem from uh, an analysis course. So obviously, so this is the projection theorem. So this uh, looks scary. <laughs> it's not too bad. I okay. learned this last year already. So it is not too bad. <laughs> okay. So yeah, it's just basically saying that under this um, <clears throat> scalar product that you have with basically that squared expectation thing, um, a projection exists onto this closed subspace, which is the attainable claims. So that's the thing that minimizes the distance between a replicable um, uh, hedge and something that's not. So you're just trying to minimize that error. And then if we go further down. <laughs> Uniqueness of B. Well, let's carry on. Keep let's going go. down. Yeah, we're going to talk about the universal approximation theorem. Let's skip, skip. Still far. It's not too bad. Come on. That, that's scary. You know, when, when you see like <laughs> little weird things above capital letters and... Well, there's only so much notation you can use. You I know. You just get them going. You, you start getting creative. <laughs> so let's see. You can carry on. Carry on. Yeah, I mean, some this, examples of activation. Functions. I mean, this this is like first year XR. You know, everyone should should yeah, get this. Everyone should be fine. Ooh, okay. Got... Yeah. On the next page, the starts. Just at the start of the page there. Sorry, my mouse is like. <laughs> you can see it. This okay, yeah. just the PDF is giving my computer this little rainbow. So wheel. the universal approximation theorems for neural networks. This is basically just saying, can we approximate that trading strategy that now we've shown exists? Okay. Uh, so and spoiler alert, we can. We can. We, we can. can. Yes, okay, we cool. can. Okay. Unfortunately, I couldn't. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, only with my bad computer. But I can, you can, in theory. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's basically just saying that neural networks are dense in the space of continuous functions. So, oh, what? so dense just means that the closure of that space is equal to the continuous function. So it, it means that if you choose a continuous function, yeah. You can find with arbitrary con uh, precision a neural network that approximates it. So okay. you can get as close as possible to this continuous function using a neural network. Okay, I'm going to pretend I understood that. We've got this, man. Hey, <laughs> this is, this is I, I feel like yo, my brain is getting like worked over time. Um, We're getting tired. Hey? I think... I think <laughs> <laughs> it's too much for you. It, 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 it's a lot to take in. But it's fine. We go to the juicy stuff. Let's, let's carry on. Let's go see some pretty pictures, actually. Okay, sure. So, yeah. we... so let's go to just... We'll Ooh. maybe just do geometric Brownian motion. Okay, let's do... Yeah. We'll geometric. leave the Brayton model. We'll just keep it nice and simple. So we, can always, we can always do part two. You know, We can be like one of those people, if this video gets a thousand likes, we're going to do part two. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Then maybe I can rerun the model by then. Yeah. Or maybe not. Yeah. If we get a thousand... I kind of feel like starting new research now. Oh, as cool as this was. No, you're, you, if you're onto something, you've got to... Yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll try. You could sell this to some hedge fund manager for billions. Yeah, but I don't want to. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to make money. I just want, I want to do cool stuff. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, that, obviously, that's... everyone wants to make money. I do something, but I still... I first want to do cool stuff. You want to make money while you make cool stuff. Yes, yes. That's, that's the dream. That's the dream. Yeah. Okay. This is something that I have fortunately seen before. This is nice. Um, like yeah, I said, CT8. Have you done a video on this? Yes. CM2. So hopefully other people also understand most of it. Um, I should make a video. I should make a video kind of explaining. Let, let's see if, if I'm right. This is your drift yes. parameter and that is your diffusion parameter. Yeah, so the volatility. Oh, there you've called, oh, called it. 
drift and volatility. Um, and yes, yes, I know that. That's quite so, cool. You get this through, this is Ito's lemma gets yeah. you to this thing. So you solve that stochastic differential equation. Yes. Which, and then you get this nice formula, which keeps the stock prices above zero, which yes. is quite nice. Do you know why it keeps it above zero? Because you're taking the lin. Yeah, well. And then the lin can't go. Well, I say lin, how do you say it? How do you say the natural it's lin. It's lin. Is it lin? Yeah. Okay. okay, just, I don't know if people say Just lin. checking, just checking. Just checking. Okay, talk to me about the pretty pictures. Okay, so this one What on here, earth happened here? So this it's one is just 30 simulated. 30? Yeah, so this okay. is nice and clean, obviously for the data, nice it's like 25,000, but we, didn't, we don't want to picture up 25,000 parts like this. Okay. Too. But the big thing here is we just try to make it relevant, right? So a stock price of 100, cool. Uh, a time period of three months. Okay. So we said there are uh, 80 trading dates. So that was taking into account public holidays and, and stuff we don't control. trade. Uh, volatility of 0.06 and a drift of 0.03. So this is just a pretty picture of some stock. What could happen? Some go up, some go down. So, so some sometimes straight. this purple one did really well. Yeah. And then this red one didn't do too, yeah. didn't do too lack of. So obviously now you're trying to hedge a payoff on this. Um, but you don't know if it's going to go up or down. You so don't. can you you've try got this get You've got this little funnel of doubt. Yeah, so we have there on the right uh, some core call payoffs on these stock parts so you can see some are at zero some go to like 110 so obviously the stock price like, mm -hmm. escalates <laughs> yeah like, very far yeah that's quite interesting that distribution did you expect that shape no. <laughs> hey not really i didn't expect anything i was just making cool plots and just seeing how things look should it not have been somewhat normal why because remember, there's, there's uh, first is log normal. Right? Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe it has some sort of thing there. Um, also, there's a bound at the bottom. So once things go down, they just hit zero, right? Okay. Yeah, so it's a bit of a shift in there. In there, okay. Yeah. And then... So this is just explaining what explaining I just explained. Data. Yeah. And then, ooh, this Looks is... Looks like I didn't actually change. Huh? There's a typo there. Oof. Let's not go back up. <laughs> well, let's, let's see if any of the viewers can identify Five. the typo. Okay, cool. So it can go down. <laughs> Sorry, it's your <laughs> yeah. Uh, up. yeah, it's fine. Okay, what is this validation error thing? So this was a function I made to, obviously now you want to choose hyperparameters. So you want to run different models uh, just to see which one is the best. Mm -hmm. So we ran a few parameters, which you've listed there at the top. So Changing the C dimension, uh, okay. that's that memory cell. So one, three, or five. And we could only run on my terrible computer neurons of 25, 25 on each neural okay. network, which will maybe try and make it a little bit wider. And then three activation functions. Um, so these are the best um, parameters. Okay. We got and that three sigmoid tan h 25 25 you know that that was the best parameters so what you do is you train your set mm -hmm. right you have one validation set so we just check the error on that validation set it then checked all of these parameters plotted the middle one and passes those the best parameters through to another training session after it's checked that um, and then it trains it some more okay so that's how i built this uh, system here yeah, going obviously you don't want to see the parameters then come back then rerun it on the best parameters so just had this continuous flow checked it plotted it passed those best parameters through to the next one and then trained it some more okay that's yeah. quite clever yeah it was quite a little time saver that yeah <laughs> well it still runs for like two days but <laughs> time saver yeah. okay and then talk to me about what's happening here does, so that, these... does that mean the black skulls did a better job the Black Shoals did do a better job. The Black Shoals did a bigger job. Uh, so uh, oh, my bad computer. Just let's, let's see. Let's see. Okay. I'll, I'll try to rerun it sometime and then we'll see. I just have a lot of things coming up. But I'm hoping. I'm like hoping to beat it. Just couldn't do it here. Couldn't. But the Time pressure is a bit shit. But this is the thing. It, it beats it for... So it, it doesn't beat it for this one. Oh, yeah. 
but it does beat it for Merton. For Merton. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't beat it on geometric Brownian motion. So the thing is, Black-Scholes is derived from this notion of the stocks following a geometric Brownian motion. So it also knows the exact parameters. Mm -hmm. But in theory, we could maybe beat it because of this discrete timeness, right? So now Black-Scholes is a perfect hedge in continuous time. But in discrete time, you can see it actually has a distribution around zero. It's not, it's not perfect. Okay. If it was perfect, then the, that pink bar would just, just be... Just be at zero down. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is a profit and loss. So you all, you all make quite a lot of loss. <sighs> yeah. It's <just> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a badly trained model. It's, 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 but it's more about the theory. theory. Yeah. It's about the theory it's and about... about the can it actually do it? Yes. And it trade, yeah. And it actually did trade. Yeah, I it mean, did. It, it and it's not, that's not too bad for something I didn't train that hard. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. But like I said, the Formula 1's coming up. Yeah. Well, we can actually just end it. We don't so, need to talk about this, do we? We don't need to talk about the Mertens no, and all so these it's other things. No, it's basically the exact same thing, just a but different just distribution. A, yeah, and a you different actually, graph. And you beat it this time. Yes, and okay. we beat it that time. Okay, so... Maybe just the extensions. Just a quick... Talk what to me. You want. Talk to me very quickly about the extensions. So yeah, so in the actual project, obviously we only did a call option, and it was European. So the payoffs at the end, and it has the same sort of structure. But you can obviously extend this to different types of options. So we want to do that. So big thing was American and Bermuda options. Can we Ooh. change the neural network to exercise early? Tell us quickly what... So American, you can exercise any time before the expiry date. European, yes. you can only do it on the date. Bermuda is basically in between European and American. Okay. So what it is, is that you can only trade on specific dates. Uh, so let's say maybe every three days or something. So yeah, that's, so you that's can't trade thing. any time before the thing. It has these jumps. So in those three days, the stock price could plummet and come back up. Oh, yes. But you, so you can only trade on those dates. So uh, okay, so it's that a little bit. So you want to get it for? I mean, but there's, I mean, there's like Russian, there's Asian, there's all various different oh, yeah, so of options. Asian, everything. And so you want to get the model so that it it can do all of these. Yeah. Okay. Talk to me about these other two extensions here. Okay, so applications, uh, I only provided for hedging. hedging. Okay. Um, but there are other applications in the financial industry, like forecasting, filtering, and trading. This one's an interesting one. So how, many, how much profit can you yeah, make? Yeah, why don't you state? make it about this? Do you know how we would have got like a million views if you had made it about trading? Yeah. Because you know what people don't like hedging? Hedging just means less money if you're right. Yeah. Pretty much, like you do <laughs> want to make a profit. Yeah, so I haven't, but I haven't done any of these extensions yet. So okay, we'll see how it goes. But they, they are these applications, and they are there's some code. What, why would you want to do it for filtering? What's the whole What's the whole point of doing that? I was just thinking about the other things. Um, so finding the true underlying stock pattern, oh, which okay. is pretty much, I guess, for forecasting and trading, it's like a middle ground. Yes. So can you? get this true pattern on the stocks instead of this disgusting view of everything long-term trends things like that yeah okay that could actually be very interesting then. yeah okay and then finally talk to me about this last extension yeah uh, so this is just obviously we only did um, Monte Carlo simulation so mm -hmm. we compared the stuff to the black I mean so geometric Brownian motion and the Merton model uh, but can we train it on these two models and actually trade stocks? Obviously, I'm not going to go out and go destroy the market now. I'll, I'll give you 200 bucks <laughs> to, to look behind this model. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that could be interesting. <laughs> just don't cry when I lose it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just want to see how it performs on real data after. Yeah. On real. And then, actually, just got, got one, one last question. We've got five minutes until the Grand Prix starts. Um, one last question. Of everyone that you read in your thing of a jig here, I like how you're referencing yourself. That's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what was an interesting project? Who, who, oh, is that Mario? Yeah. Just a quick, basic. Quick little thing there. Oh, oh, oh Mario, Mario, fantastic. Where's your stuff? Maybe yeah, where's, where's my stuff? You didn't, <laughs> you didn't reference. I've got one, one article out and it's got one citation only. So okay. you, need to, you need to cite it, get, get that little thing up. But anyway, coming back to the question. 
of all the people you read, who would you recommend was worth reading more of just their work? Like you saw this person, you're like, wow, this guy's like a genius. Okay, so in terms mm. of uh, trading and financial maths and everything, yes. uh, Martin Schweizer, number 12. Number 12, Martin Schweizer. Yeah. So he's, he's pretty good at the stuff. And Shuraev in general. Um, so things about probability theory, finance and stuff like that. You I know. think I've got a textbook by this guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's great. great. Yeah. I was just thinking, I know that. And guy. then biggest inspiration is uh, Malusi Mabuso. Six, seven and eight. Just different things. So he was my lecturer and my supervisor. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so worth checking those guys out. And then, yeah, like I said, we do have the Formula One coming up. Let's you know, do it. Leclerc, let's hope he wins Singapore. Did he, did he, he, he got qualify pole. first? He got pole position. Yeah, everyone was like, what? Like, yeah. Yeah. Patrick. He's going to go for it. Three, yeah. three, three for three, yeah? So, so let's go watch that. And just to everybody watching, if you've also written a really cool paper and um, you'd like to come and discuss it on the channel, hit me up and... Yeah, because we can even do this as a series. That could be. And then you can you must join as well, and you can like criticize the papers uh, as people talk about. No, I'm joking. We, <laughs> we will be not. <laughs> okay, cool. And yeah, I think without further ado, cheers everyone, and uh, have a great weekend or week whenever you're watching this. Yeah, cool. Keep up. Enjoy. Cheers.